Good afternoon, everybody. Dr. Nick Coatsworth here with today's top three. And today I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Lucas Detoka, head of the department's primary healthcare response to COVID-19. But first, a shout out. Today, my shout out goes to Linda. Linda uh, watched this segment two days ago when I spoke about the need for us all to consider whether we need cancer screening, whether we're eligible, and if we are, uh, to make sure we book in to do our cancer screening. And, and Linda watched the segment and did that. That's, uh, I'm, I'm so pleased to hear that, Linda, because uh, we really want those messages to get out. And, and there are other aspects to our health, Lucas, uh, that, uh, that aren't COVID related. Absolutely. As difficult as that is um, to, to remember when all that's going on down in Victoria is happening at the moment, but we must take good care of our health. Now, a uh, very special segment today, and I'd just like to invite uh, Lucas to acknowledge a country for us. Thanks, Nick. We are recording from Nunawal country today, so I'm going to acknowledge uh, their land in their language. Daura Nuna, Daura Nunawal, Yango Gulanying, Ngalawiri Dunai, Nunawal Daura. Wangarali Jinyin, Marin Palang, Bugarabang. This is beautiful Nunawal country and I pay my respects to the elders and the elders uh, and owners of any uh, nation uh, from which people are watching today. Thank you, Lucas. So a bit of background uh, for Lucas. So as I said, uh, Lucas is heading our primary care response to COVID-19 in the department, and he is co-chair uh, with colleagues from the National Aboriginal Control Community Health Organisations, or NACHO, of our uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander advisory group on COVID-19, which is provided to the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee critical advice uh, to help us protect our First Nations people in, in Australia, uh, which is absolutely um, critically important. And uh, really, we, we do have uh, an excellent track record so far on that. Uh, before COVID-19, Lucas led the National Task Force to address the syphilis outbreak in Northern and Central Australia and other Indigenous health initiatives. Lucas was actually Chief Health Officer out at Millwatch Health. I didn't know that. When yeah. were you there? Uh, 2013 to, to, to a couple of years ago. Yeah. So there you go. Lucas was in the Northern Territory at the same time as me. Uh, and uh, I visited East Arnhem on a few occasions, largely to go fishing, but it's a beautiful part of the world. And Gove District Hospital as well, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. So a shout out to all you people out in Gove uh, and uh, in Arnhem Land and in East Arnhem in in particular. And to those who are in Miwatch Health at the moment, uh, there are a number of uh, programs, including run by the National Critical Tra Care and Trauma Response Centre, really to prepare uh, remote and regional health posts for uh, COVID-19, which is great. So um, Lucas, um, despite his impeccable uh, English, he actually studied medicine in Spain and, uh, and uh, also in Sydney with further training in public health at Harvard, where he focused on health systems policy and leadership in health and human rights. These are the sort of people that I have the privilege to work with and uh, also who are leading the response to COVID-19. So good to have you, Lucas. Let's get into top three. Thanks, Nick. Why are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people more at risk of serious illness for COVID-19? Yeah, so as people know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia have 2.3 times the rate of, of the burden of disease compared to non-Indigenous or other uh, Australians, which based on international evidence about the correlation between COVID-19, chronic, some chronic diseases and risk of severe illness, indicates that Aboriginal and Torres Strait people may be at a higher risk of uh, severe illness. That coupled with other issues related to social determinants of health, particularly in remote areas where uh, there's a lot of people living in the same house um, and their facilities might not be um, as good as in other places. Uh, also increases the risk of transmission in some of those areas. However, as Nick indicated um, earlier, uh, we do have a really good track record um, in Australia with the rate of infection among uh, First Nations people being actually lower than that among, among the general population. And that is very unique compared to how Indigenous populations have been affected by COVID-19 elsewhere internationally. And we strongly believe that that is because of the strength and the leadership of the Aboriginal health sector mm -hmm. and the strength and the leadership of our Aboriginal communities that from the get-go have been working um, hand in hand with government at all levels uh, to make sure that communities are prepared, well informed and ready. 
So, I mean, that's, it's just so critical important, critically important to emphasise that partnership yeah. um, and, and the, the primacy of uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, uh, peoples involved in the health sector, like, like your experience with Mirwatch Health as well. Um, and that this is something that all Australians uh, can be proud of. Mm -hmm. and, and, and just yet another reason why um, we need to focus these efforts on, on controlling COVID-19. Yeah, and, and it couldn't have happened if it wasn't through that partnership. Like I am, as I said, I'm a Spanish-born, non-Indigenous um, doctor working on this, so I don't have the uh, lived experience and the lived expertise um, to, to deal with Aboriginal health issues. It's, it's the Ab Aboriginal people who are leading um, on this, and that is why I'm co-chairing the group, um, the advisory group with uh, Dr. Don Casey, the Deputy CEO of NACHA, the National Aboriginal Community Control Health Organisation, has been instrumental because every step of government action, from policy design to implementation to then response to changing needs, has been exquisitely guided by what their um, Aboriginal voices, Aboriginal expertise, and Aboriginal leadership uh, know it's best for their own communities. Perfect. And what, so what, what can Indigenous people and elders uh, do in their community to help protect themselves and, and others? So um, like any other community, it's important that we all adhere um, to the three. We, do, we practice, practice physical distancing. Um, we make sure that we monitor any symptoms and however mild um, the symptoms are, if we experience cold, flu-like um, um, symptoms, we uh, stay at home, contact our health facility and get tested. Um, and what we have seen, as I was saying before, is that Aboriginal communities and the elders and the leaders were very proactive from the beginning. Um, back early in March, a lot of remote communities recognised that they had um, a higher risk of, um, of, of severe outcomes if uh, the virus made it to their communities. So they, um, in, in several parts of the country, closed down access to the communities yeah. um, by themselves, mm. restricting access to permits and etc. to make sure that they were reducing the risk of importation. And it was after some communities had done that and requested that that happen more broadly, that the government uh, implemented uh, under the biosecurity powers travel restrictions to those remote communities. So again, an example of how communities took the initiative, the elders said, we want to be protected in our communities. And then uh, the government responded by uh, utilising the powers under the Biosecurity Act to, mm. to make that wish um, become law. So that that's that's a really interesting thing that I suspect a lot of viewers um, wouldn't wouldn't be aware of that this desire to protect community came um, from community. It wasn't mm. it wasn't top down, but the legislative instrument that enabled it was definitely the Biosecurity Act. Yeah. Yeah, that's that that's that's fascinating. Um, but so if if I'm out in um, community and and I've been out um, to um, remote um, uh, communities in the Northern Territory, what's the best way um, to access information? Do you think? Because um, one of the challenges when um, that that I found was that we were um, or I as a health practitioner was often. Um, asking um, uh, Indigenous Australians who lived in remote communities to make this enormous leap into my space um, mm -hmm. where um, I was communicating and I was just trying to make, I was just only making this little leap and, and didn't really have the skills of communication um, to do that. So how, how, do we, how do we bring that closer and make sure that um, the information's out there? Yeah, so um, again, through partnership, as, um, as you've described. So. Important to note as well that even though we recognise the higher risk of remote communities, the majority of Aboriginal people, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait people, live in major cities. And we need to make sure that uh, all the communication materials, all the information that goes out, um, is um, adapted and applicable and culturally safe and relevant uh, to people in every setting. Um, in remote communities and in areas where um, tra uh, traditional languages, local languages or Creole are first language and English is our second, third or fourth, it's really important that uh, information is communicated in the primary language of, of, of people in those areas. And we have um, uh, achieved translations to 15 Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander languages uh, of radio scripts and, and, and general messaging about, about COVID uh, that has been delivered through First Nations media and um, Ab Aboriginal uh, radio services and uh, through their department's um, social media channels. Um, and then 
in uh, particularly in urban settings, what we have seen is that uh, the Aboriginal health peak bodies, uh, like the Victorian Aboriginal Community Control Health Organisation in, in Victoria or the Aboriginal Health and Medical Research Council in New South Wales, have taken a really strong um, proactive role in making sure that all the messaging is adapted, um, is made relevant and is communicated uh, to the people on the ground. Um, and that's, uh, that, that's, that's been uh, coming back and forth with um, resources that communities develop then being incorporated into the national campaign and we really encourage people to go to health.gov.au when you have a massive section on Aboriginal and Torres Strait specific resources in English and other languages that you can access. Perfect. That's such incredibly useful information. Thank you, Lucas. Now, I just wanted to remind viewers, of course, that on Sunday the Victorian Government implemented the Stage 4 restrictions in Melbourne and Stage 3 restrictions for regional Victoria. And, and these restrictions effectively will um, uh, affect Victorians differently depending on where they live. So it's very important that we all avail ourselves of, of the information that's available to ourselves. And I'd encourage all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander residents of Victoria to keep up to date with the Department of Health and Human Services, the DHHS COVID-19 information on the website, particularly the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities website that's part of DHHS. Uh, there's other uh, resources including those available on the Victorian Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation or VACHO. Uh, they have a coronavirus info hub uh, that's also, also particularly useful, um, including the extension of the Yarning Safe and Strong Counselling Service um, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in Victoria. Victoria. Now, just to conclude, um, that was such interesting insights there, Lucas, that I reckon we should try and do perhaps a remote um, guest with a, a, another great Australian leader in the Indigenous health space, Professor Sandra Eads. So um, if you can actually extend that invitation to Sandra, um, it would be great to have her on top three and we can talk more about this really, really important. important issue. Yeah. Thanks, Lucas. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.